they're yours. Hit that one more time. I am, I am the, the number one determinant, number one determinant of, the of the success or failure. Or failure. Here we go. Of my, of my student. Hey, y'all, you have a strong summer. Kick some butt next year. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's the mindset. That's the attitude. Love you guys. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on in. Come on in. Let me know where you're coming from. We got Michael, uh, Principal Ryan in the building. Michael Benton in the building. John Herrick's in the building. Monica Welch. Jennifer, um, Bortvit Mapes is in the building. Kathy Walker, uh, Shar Washington Mul uh, Moulton is in the building. Dot McKeever, Jeter, Sam Aaron, Tanya Pugh, James Wilborn, Willie Lanier, Rach, uh, uh, Ra uh, Ra Rasha Lee, I think it is, Brown, Kathy Walker. Um, Vanessa Olev is in the building. Benice Lewis, Alan Cowart, Adrian Hamity. I probably messed that up. We got Byron Collins, Garfar, WT, Sherry Jones, the Queen, Kimberly Broughton, Cafele in the building. Freddie New, uh, Freddie Nunez, Cindy Scott, my man, Principal Kitchen, Otis Kitchens in the building. Sun Kissed is in the building. Sherry Lucas Hall, the Alonda McKinney. Hit the share button as you come in, folks. Let them know, let them know, let them know. We don't miss any weeks. I was here Christmas Day. I was here New Year's Day. So you know I'm going to be here today, right? So hit that share button. Let them know. It's early in the morning. We got a high-powered guest in here today waiting in the wings. So come on in and hit the share button. Let me know if you've been with us for 89 weeks. I mean, I know that's like maybe one or two. But if you're here, let me see you. We got uh, Cynthia Farmer and uh, Anacita Sugalin in the building. If you're a first-timer, let me know you're here. If you're a first-timer. 89 weeks where you been but if you're a first timer let me know we got js in new jersey marcus and so i mean you freezing when you go outside like me right it's it's it, it, it ain't florida up here uh marcus van diver i see people down in the south with t-shirts when you watch television and news and so forth. i'm like man i wish i could be in a t-shirt man i'm all bundled up layered up hat scarf man shivering gloves but that's what it is when you live up north. Uh, Brooke Willis is in the building. Jeff Leslie, uh, Horace Cedar Harmon. Where we at? Lewis Henderson. Uh, Alice, where we at? Alice Ann Dor Schneider. Grace Castaneda. Cynthia Farmer. Rashad Davis. He, he out there in Vegas. You know, some people think in Vegas it's like hot all year round. This time of year, you're in Vegas, you're wearing a coat too. <laughs> I remember my wife and I, Went to Vegas one year in the like late fall, I think it was. And I'm like, man, this ain't this ain't what I thought. Right. Patrice Nicole Henry's in the building. Melissa Jones Chunu out there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Sha Glow, Sandra Gilman, Principal Tammy Taylor's in the building, holding it down in Chester, South Carolina. Renee Bostic, uh, <clears throat> Rochelle Brown. I said that one already. Demetrius Scott, 89 weeks strong. And Demetrius has been writing the notes, even the interviews. So you want to get with Demetrius Scott. I usually share him to my page, but sometimes y'all don't see it because he tags me and I just add it to the profile. So you don't always see it that way, but follow or, or, or send a friend request to Demetrius Scott. Those of you on Facebook. 89 weeks. He keeps the notes for us since the past several weeks. Uh, Sherrod Lamont Laws is in the building. Trina Kinsey Kelly from Indianapolis is in the building. I'll be back in Indy in the summer. I'm there every summer and, and different parts of the year. I think I'm there before the summer, though. Tiffany House is in the building. Sheikah Houston, that's Dr. 
Chica Houston. She's holding it down in Chester as well. Her and Tammy showing us all these news, these news clips this morning, man. They taking their, they taking their practice to another level. Got the media highlighting them. D Walker's in the building. Teresa Thacker, Jennifer Bortvit. I guess I said that already. Principal Stacy Mabel holding it down in Augusta, down there with the Godfather of Soul, James Brown, the hardest working man in show business bar. None. None. We got uh who we got here? It says Facebook user. I don't know what that means. From Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? There he is, Principal Josh Tovar in the building. In the building. He said, Buenos dias, Hefe. Listening to the Fantastic Five PD. Well, when 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 I bring this guest up here, you better focus and shift here because she getting ready to blow the roof off, man. So we who else we go? We, we got Yolanda McKinney on fire. She holding it down in Little Rock, Arkansas. Cord Cordell Zachary, Jessica Paldo, Sean Hurt. That's the birthday man, right? I'm I'm getting ready to start it too, but Sean Hurt, Principal Sean Hurt. Y'all know Principal Sean Hurt out, out there holding it down, in Detroit traveling all over the country, helping these schools to become great. Well, it's his birthday today. He turned 65. Man, Sean Hurd is old, man. He turned 65. Nah, Sean Hurd ain't 65. He's still in his 40s, man. <laughs> Happy birthday to Sean Hurd. Hey, y'all, let's get it going, man. It's, we, we got a big guest, big time guest on today. Let me say formally to everybody, good morning. Greetings. Welcome to week 89 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. And I don't know about you. I say it every week for 89 weeks. I don't know about you. But if I could just speak for me, just give me a minute, man. I, I need to speak for me. I need to let you know how I feel right now at 1102 Eastern Time. I'm on fire. That's how I feel. I say it every week. I feel it every day. But on this broadcast, I say it, but I but it's purposeful. I say it for a reason. Because these are difficult times, man. These are challenging times. These are overwhelming times. These are frustrating times. And sometimes somebody needs to identify with, relate with somebody else that may have the flames that I need. I'm, I'm tired, Principal Kefele. I'm exhausted, Principal Kefele. I'm worn out, Principal Kefele. It's overwhelming, Principal Kefele. It's not like it used to be, Principal Kefele. But if I could find somebody else that got some fire, that got some energy, that got some excitement, that got some enthusiasm, I could at least lock in with them. So I'm saying to you right now, I'm on fire! Woo! That's how I'm feeling. Hope I got a voice for the next hour, right? That's how I'm feeling. So I'm saying to you, take that fire, own that fire, claim that fire, embrace that fire, man, because it's not easy out here. I get it. But you chose leadership. That's what you chose, man. You chose leadership. So despite the difficulty, the challenges, you still got to bring it. You don't have to bring it charismatically, but you got to bring it because your students are dependent on you. Your staff is dependent upon you. Your, your community is dependent upon you. With that said, let me go through my, to my quick motivational message. I'm calling it today, Who Am I as a Leader? Real quick, it's just a connection to last week's message when we talked about the leadership mission. Who am I? I'm talking about like separate your, your professional self for a second. And I want you to look at your personal self. Who is that? And in what way is that person driving the professional side? Make no mistake about it. Although Principal Kefele and Baruti Kefele are two separate entities, do know Principal Kefele needed fuel. He needed 
gas. And he got the fuel and the gas from Baruti. So Baruti was pouring the gas into principal. And now I'm getting now I'm able to do this work at the level that I needed to do it in. But that Baruti Kafele had an identity. And it's that identity to who I am as, as, as an individual that drove who I was as that principal, right? So, so who are you as a leader? Sometimes we get so caught up into the work that we forget who we are. We forget why we're there. We forget the big picture. We forget the vision. You can never lose sight of any of that. And, and, and our guest today is tied right in. So there's so much. Let me let me give you these quick announcements. Number one, uh, welcome to the first timers. Because I know every week there are people for the first time. Welcome. We, we I had a couple people this week say to me um, when I when I when I did some professional stuff, Kafele, vert some professional virtual stuff. Kafele, you you're you're not like you are on Saturday. No, you ain't getting that. That's Saturday. That's like living room stuff, right? When I'm out professional and I start screaming, I'm on fire! Man, the, the superintendent might run me out of town, man. <laughs> so that's that's what I'm on, on my platform, right? So, so yeah, so that's how we do that, right? So uh, welcome to the first time. It's the ASCD virtual leadership summit i keep telling y'all that's coming up on the 18th i'm the opening keynote so you know i want to see you in the building it's virtual just go to ascd.org and register and i see you there um the whole lot of great great speakers gonna be there but you know i'm gonna open it up right so so be there with me when we open it on the 18th i don't know what time it's it go to ascd.org and you will see it uh you know i started that secondly i started that school talk platform that's a platform where we specifically talk about educating black children. That's all it's about. Nothing else. No other agenda. Educating black children. I just can't put it on a set day and time because my travel schedule is too crazy. So it's different times. So this coming Wednesday night, put this in your calendar. Wednesday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, my, my guest will be Dr. Donna Ford, the guru of gifted education for black children. Right. The guru. Ohio State university professor, professor in other schools previous, but right now, Ohio State University. She'll be my guest, eight o'clock Eastern. Those of you watching right now on YouTube, you won't be able to see it on that channel anymore. I'm not using that channel for school talk. I'm using my Principal Cafele Speaks to Educators channel. So go to that channel, please, right, like right now on a different device and subscribe to it for the YouTube folks. Facebook, I'm going to have it on my Principal Kafele page only. I will not have it on my virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page. So, so you know, set your notifications up so that for, so that you can receive the uh, message on Facebook, and then Twitter will be my regular at Principal Kafele page, right? So that's for school talk to this Wednesday, eight o'clock. Then later on in the month, I don't remember the date, but I'll have um, Zaretta Hammond on um, the role cultural responsive teaching in the brain on the last Thursday of January. So I'll tell you more about that later, right? But that again, that channel, that platform is specifically for talking about educating, motivating, empowering black children. Nothing else. That's what it's for. Let's go. Um, Sunday morning commentary every Sunday on, on my virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page up by no later than 10 o'clock. So you want to make sure you read those. They're always pertinent and related to the Saturday Academy. Uh, real quick, you know, I got to plug these whenever I'm on here. I got I got I got 12 books I wrote, but these are the two I've been showing you all for the past couple of months. The newest one where we at? I'm, I'm reversed. The Equity and Social Justice Education, 50 Critical Questions for Improving Opportunities and Outcomes for Black Students and the Assistant Principal 50 Critical Questions for Meaningful Leadership and Professional Growth. You can get them anywhere. Education books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, PrincipalCafele.com, and um, wherever education books are sold. Get yourself a copy. Um, I'm, I'm rocking the Jacksonville Red Caps today. Negro Leagues always. These are my Superman shirts. I got about 50 of them upstairs, maybe a little bit more. But Jacksonville, uh, Florida, Red Caps is what I'm wearing today. With that said, 
man i got a big time guest on here today so hit the share button hit the retweet button let them know we we here we in the building man let me bring her up here and we got tovey scruggs hussein in the building man if you don't know her you will by the time we get finished today so hit that share button hit that retweet button and let them know we are in the building strong and ready to rock so let me say to you good morning to you tovey great to see you good morning principal kafele it is fabulous to be here thank you for having me uh, indeed indeed i want to share with them your your bio so you guys listen up to hear who's getting ready to speak to us tovey Scr tovey scruggs hussein a visionary healer and award-winning urban educator with almost 30 years of leadership and transformation experience she is internationally recognized for her signature approach of moving from leadership doing to leadership being and emotionally intelligent equity and inclusion that's a lot right there y'all recently toby has been recognized by mindful magazine as one of the powerful women leaders of 2021 who are igniting the world with courage and wisdom. She talks her talk of courageousness, leadership, being cultivated by meditation, resilience, and self-mastery, and having had a daily meditation practice for almost 30 years, and also sitting four week long silent retreats. That's very interesting. Toby is on a mission to heal our leaders and organizations through self-transformation for school and systemic transformation. Toby is a certified coach and has been personally trained by Brene. I always wonder how to pronounce her name. Brene, right? You yeah. got it. Uh -huh. Brene Brown as a certified dare to lead facilitator to train others in courageous leadership with the lens of inclusion and belongingness. Yet the very best leadership training she ever received has been the 17 years she spent as a high school principal. I want to read that sentence again. Yet the very best <clears throat> leadership training she ever received has been the 17 years she spent as a high school principal. I want you to let that resonate, folks. Um, she's a founding adjunct professor of trauma-informed leadership with an equity lens at Mills College and is, a, is the national president for the coalition for schools educating mindfully. She's also the visionary of racial healing uh, allies, a movement to create truly inclusive schools and organizations. Toby cultivates conscious, connected, and courageous leaders worldwide. Our website, www.tesilus, no, that's wrong, tesius.com, right? Again, www.tesius.com, that's spelled T I C I. E S S once again, T I C I E S S dot com. Take that down, but we'll talk more about it as we proceed. Hey, folks, I'm glad you're here today. Hit the share button, hit the retweet button. Let them know, particularly the, the assistant principals out there. You know, the core focus is the AP, the aspiring AP. But also, you know, we know we got principals on here, superintendents, directors, assistant mm -hmm. scoops, and we even have, um, um, not the secretary, I'm, he's a friend, but the commissioners of education, some of them have popped on here as well. So I want to get I want to get going, y'all. So Toby, as an educator, who is Toby Scrubs? Who say? Oh, wow. I feel like I am an embodiment of my years of experience since kindergarten in school. Um, taking all of the experiences that I have had as both a student and a, a teacher called into this work. And, and then again, the, those years of on the job training are, I feel like our profession is like no other in, in what prepares us. And so the experiences that I have had in school have shaped me into the leader that I am. When you say, who am I? One of my monikers is goddess at work. So I really bring also the, the personal infusion of, of my own spirit and energy of what I call the alpha energy 
into uh, my own beingness and how I lead and and really seeing that so much of what we think about leadership is technical, but it's not. And I wish I had a, a more succinct answer, if you will, uh, for, for who am I? But I consider myself a leader of leaders and healer of healers because I've done the work on myself. I have truly engaged in that self transformation that I saw directly impact school transformation and systemic transformation. And the leadership energetic is what impacts your environment and impacts those that you serve. They are literally following the lead both um, in the physical sense and also in the energetic sense of what are you bringing into the space? You guys heard that, you know, the, the, the one thing that resonated that self transformation that impacted school transformation. That's, that's critical, you know, and I, I feel, I feel guilty, you know, folks, I traveled this week and my mirror is still in the bag and my bag is over there. So next time, so when Toby answers the next question, I'm gonna run and get it. Right. The so blue mirror, right? Blue mirror is in the bag, but it's sitting over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Self-transformation, folks. The the, the the implications between school transformation and self-transformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so much that can be said, but I got so many questions. So let me let me keep going. So 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 Toby, why why'd you enter the field of education and, and what continues mm -hmm. to drive your passion? For the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Ooh, two really big events in my life um, caused me to go into education. And it was the second event that caused me to reflect back on the earlier event. And the the biggest one of the biggest events was that I did great in school growing up. My mother valued education for me so much so that she lied about her address so that I could get into the best schools, which were oftentimes not in our neighborhood and they were white schools. That left a profound impact. And then moving on into the death of my mother when I was in ninth grade. Mm. When my mother died when I was in ninth grade, my whole education changed. I had then gone from a private all girls school to Inglewood High School, where the forum is in Southern California, to an inner city school. And I was so disappointed in the low quality of education that I was being given, that I recognized as a high school student, that I saw that I was not being treated as though I was brilliant. I was not being treated as though I could exceed. The expectations were not high. I taught my sophomore honors English class. Wow. I taught it. Wow. Because my teacher was dysfunctional. She had a flask in her bottom drawer. And I would speak to it. I would tell it. And there was like, teachers are hard to find. We're just going to have to make it work. And from Inglewood High School, Principal Cafele, I went on to UC Berkeley. And that's where I had that awakening. I was in a room full of 300 students in a Shakespeare class. And in those 300 students, no one looked like me. Mm -hmm. And the professor started that class with, okay, this is Shakespeare 101. We know that it's really um, review for all of you. And we're just going to go ahead and dive in. And in that moment, my black brilliance felt so small because I had never read Shakespeare. How had I graduated in the top 10 in my class, made it into UC Berkeley, and had never read Shakespeare? Because no one thought that I was the type of student who should read Shakespeare or could read Shakespeare. And in that moment, 
I decided that I was not going to be a journalist, the first black bilingual news broadcaster. Hmm. I was going to become a teacher so that no black child ever felt like that again. And that led me back to my mother's passing. And that the day that my mother died, Principal Cafele, I went to school. The day my mother died, I went to school. To the place that felt normal. I went to the place that would allow me to simply just be and not have to necessarily make meaning yet out of my mother's death that I wasn't ready to handle. And that's when I realized later as an adult, which is why healing in school became and trauma responsiveness became so powerful for me, is that we don't know what our students are coming with, but school is that damn powerful. School in the lives of our students for consistency, for belonging, for connection, and hopefully for deep preparation when we are doing it right. When we are doing it right, kids will find their refuge for their future where they spend the majority of their time when we get it right. You you said a lot. lot. One of the things that I wanna highlight, you say, I'm gonna quote you, school, is that damn powerful. So I I, I got the mirror now. And and, and I'm I'm asking the viewers, based on that statement, based on the totality of what you heard, is your school, and I'll use that word, is your school that damn powerful because you are a leader in it or the aspiring people because of the school that you want to lead one day? or the folks who are in principal leadership because you lead it. Is it is it that damn powerful because you're in leadership? Is there a correlation between your presence as a leader and the education that children receive? That's why this instrument is so powerful to me, mm-hmm. right? You got to go to it. You know, Toby, you became a principal, and there's a lot of reasons that we, we make that decision. Just like all the folks on the call this morning, there's a lot of reasons that folks either want to be or, or, or are in that position now. What drove your decision? Thinking about all the different reasons, what was that one, right? That one that sort of superseded everything else and you said, this is why I have to leave. I have naturally been a leader. Um, I didn't want to be a principal. Hmm in our system. Mm -hmm. And what often I I underplay now and really shouldn't is that I left the public school system to start my own private school for black children. And we were fully WASC accredited grades six through 12. It ran for eight years. And I was so disheartened by what was happening in our public school with our black and brown children. I said, you know what? I got to leave this system to go out and do my own thing because I can't do it any worse. Mm. <laughs> I was like, I won't get it more wrong than we're already getting it because the data is speaking for itself. And I planned for four years with a colleague. We planned and planned and planned. We had planned ourselves out. And the only thing we could do was lease a building and open the doors and see who came. Mm. Um, At our height, we had about 100 students, again, grades 6 through 12. We had no achievement gap. Every student was functioning above grade level. We had no special ed program and had families begging us to let in their special ed children, particularly the black boys. And we would say, well, we don't have a special ed program. We're not equipped yet. And you know what? It didn't matter. They rose. Hmm. They rose. Because all of our teaching was infused with the strategies and skills that our children really needed. In the economic downturn of 2008, our school ended up closing in 09. I was heartbroken. Um, I couldn't return to the system because I, I was like, I've already done it better than the system. 
And in my spirit, it was like, okay, the true test is, and that's where I even came up with the self transformation for systemic transformation. Transformation, the, the concepts of how you create transformation and cultural reacculturation, the same they work for your own is how they work for the larger entity. Transformational pieces. And so I left education altogether. I became an executive director at the YMCA. And I was miserable. A month in, Dr. Caffelle, excuse me, Principal Caffelle, a month in, I was like, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Huh. <laughs> I was like, my whole spirit was like, you're not in education. This doesn't feel right. It wasn't right because I believe that the work of being an educational leadership is sacred. It is absolutely sacred. Woo. And I had stepped out of my calling. I had stepped out of my calling and I felt it in every part of my being. So I was there for two years and literally the timing could not have been any better. I get an email one day saying the principalship at San Lorenzo High School is now available. That was the school I left. So broken and disheartened about black and brown children's outcomes at that school. Yeah. That was the school that caused me to create my own school. It was the only school I'd ever taught at. And they were like, you should apply for principal. And I was like, I've been out of the system for 10 years. I haven't been in public education for 10 years. But spirit was like, you know what? Can you scale what you did? That's how we know. Can you scale what you did? And I beat out seven other interviewees, six mm. of whom were all white men. I was put through the ringer in that interview process because they couldn't believe the outcomes I had achieved. They couldn't believe what I was saying and how I was saying I was going to do it at San Lorenzo High. And when I got that job at San Lorenzo High, it was literally the day before school started. The day before school started was when I started. So I didn't have that opportunity that we love to have as principals to lay that foundation over the summer, to lay that foundation in the late spring about this is what it's going to look like. So I had to come in and fast track shifting results. So I saw it as karma. Basically, I was like, karma was like, oh, you're going to come back to what you left <laughs> and, and, and walk the talk and walk the talk. Hey, you know, I, and, and I know that I know your story there and I, and I got some more questions there that I'm going I'm to come back to later on. So for now. Let me say to the folks out here, I'm still in the intro, y'all. We, we haven't we haven't even touched the body of this conversation yet, right? So hit that share button for me. Hit that retweet button. If you got folks depending on you, say at 12 o'clock or whatever, tell them, yo, I got to stay here, right? We it, it's, it's some powerful information getting dropped this morning. I got to stick around. So, 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 Toby, you know, before we get to the body, we're in the age of COVID. And there are, as I said in the intro, the, my, my motivational message, there are some exhausted, there, there, there's a plethora of exhausted educators out here, even though they had the break during Christmas. It's, we're back and, and folks are exhausted because they're telling me already. Right. So we're, we got it. We got a lot of exhausted folks, justifiably so teacher shortages, substitute shortages. I was just watching a Boston superintendent was teaching a class the other day. So it's, you know, folks feel overwhelmed and there's no break. So my question to you, what what might and I, I want to focus on the AP, but but not limited to the AP. Mm -hmm. What might an exhausted, overworked assistant principal or even principal do towards sustaining some kind of balance so that so that I can alleviate some of that exhaustion that that I have from the work itself, knowing that I got I got my own challenges at home simultaneously? Great question. Um, we're learning so much from this time period. And I want to just acknowledge before I respond, I'm really appreciating all the, the notes of encouragement in the chat. I am seeing them. <clears throat> um, and so just thank you so much for the audience participation and the encouragement. I know that our profession is exhausting as it is. And so for it to be compounded with what else is happening 
right now to me is just heartbreaking. Um, it is really showing the, the systemic oppression at, at a level that I don't think we paid attention to before. We always have known that education has gotten the, the lower end of the stick, has been placed uh, lower on the bar. But this shows it greatly because there are so many, there's so much wealth in our nation that we could literally be buying more space. We have empty buildings, Facebook, Salesforce, all the Google, they've got empty buildings. <clears throat> We could be putting teachers and classes that can truly be safe and have social distancing and have support. Like these are companies that could pay for support and additional needs. And we are allowing the people that contribute to the future of our humanity to be in this much pain and suffering it is such a mar as big as racism on our culture of what we are doing to our educators and our students and our families. It is, it is such disrespect. And so what can we do as the educators? I know it sounds crazy to even respond in this way, but three things. The first is meditate. You're like, wait, what? Sit there and do nothing? Yes. Because you simply connecting to your own breath, it's research based that it's going to create, create an equilibrium with your nervous system. Mm. You're going to actually relax your nervous system and your nervous system has not had a chance to relax, not even on the brakes because you're so anticipatory and anxious over what's going to happen next that you can't get to a state of calm. So you have to be intentional about forcing yourself into that place of calm within your physiology mm. and the physiological response of calm is going to then actually communicate a state of calm into your brain. The research shows this. It's a rewiring that happens, but it's physiological. So we have to be intentional about that. <clears throat> the other is boundaries. What are some boundaries for your own wellness during this time? We serve from such a huge loving place that we want to, to always be on and always be there. But you have got to set your boundaries for your own well-being. Because if you are not well, your campus is not well. Bottom line, when you are not well, your campus is not well. And part of those boundaries is my third thing. Don't take it home with you. There's only so much that you can do. And the, guess what? The work is always going to be there. I was raised by an assistant principal and a principal. My stepmother was an assistant principal and a principal and then a superintendent. And I remember she carried that box home with her every day, carried a box of work home with her every day. And sometimes she didn't even touch the box. It stayed by the door and it go back in the car. And I started carrying that bag home with me every day of papers that I wouldn't grade because I was so exhausted. The work doesn't end in our profession. The work doesn't end. So you've got to just not take it home with you, especially right now. And I'm not saying to don't take it home with you for always, because again, this is a sacred calling. So it's never not with us. But right now, that peace around your own resilience and self-care has got to be heightened. And so you've got to turn it off so that you can give. The phrase that I've been using lately that came through for me because I was pushing myself to be of service and I continue to. 
but it's rest hard, work easy. Rest hard, work easy. Wow. Hey, folks out there, I, you know, Toby and I were speaking off camera before we came on, and I just want to share what I've said to her, and I've said it to others. I love this Saturday Academy. I freaking love this Saturday Academy because it's it's just so much information. She said, you, you've got to be intentional about bringing about a, a sense of calm, right? And, and I, I don't know that we think about that being intentional about bringing about some calm bringing it down but then being intentional about setting boundaries that's critical that's why that's why i love this academy so much because i know that there are folks on this call right now on this thread right now or the ones that don't comment but just watch and and and, and your weeks are brutal and, and you're not necessarily intentional about the boundaries, intentional about bringing about calm in your life. And then, and then, and then she capped it off when, when you are not well, your campus is not well. You're the leader or one of the leaders. And if you're not well emotionally, you're not well mentally, you're not well psychologically, then your campus is not well either. Because you're the leader of that campus. Hey, y'all, we still in intro phase, man. I haven't gotten to the body. And it's like 1136. Let me let me transition. Eastern time. Toby's in California. It's real early. <laughs> let me let me let me get to it. I, I, told, I, I need you guys to hang out with us today. I told her I got 12 questions, but in, I'm in part, well, seven questions in the body, but, but part one, I mean, uh, first question of the body is a five-part question, right? So just hang in here. Let's go with it. Toby, you, you, you're you part of an elite family of school leaders, meaning that you are a turnaround principal by, by no stretch of the imagination. That, that's what you are. And that's not an easy task. Most of us in this field will 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 never be able to do that, right? It's 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 just such an overwhelming responsibility to lead a school. But here you've done that. You led a school that you once taught, as you outlined before, that went from severely underperforming to award winning, right? Again, severely underperforming to award winning. So with that question one a, <laughs> when you walked into that school after having taught there previously how did you determine your initial priorities and and what were they mm -hmm. great question great question um i first i walked the halls and visited the classrooms that was the very first thing that i did um and and i could see that there was a lot of social capital there the the teachers genuinely cared about the students excuse me one second i have to cough thank you the student the the teachers genuinely cared about the students um so there was a lot of social capital and kids were coming to school like you know my ada was in the 90th percentile so it wasn't like okay they're not coming because they're not feeling it they're feeling it but but we weren't really bringing it to really hook them into academic excellence it was a lot of um a, what i call a cultural disconnect mm -hmm. meaning that my staff being pretty much 86 percent white teachers did not fully understand the the 93 percent student of color that we were serving that demographic and that cultural disconnect impacts the way you deliver what you do yeah. when you don't fully understand your client you don't govern yourself as, as a proper business if you will to use that type of language and so it was really critical that i then saw oh so what needs to happen is I got to work on this cultural disconnect. So that became one of the top priorities was honestly showing one, what are our strengths? Anchoring to our strengths 
of service and care. Then I said, you know what? This data hasn't changed. Our data hasn't changed in 20 years. You all are outstanding teachers. I have seen you teach. But why is our data horrible? And so I had to bring it back. Like we've got these strengths, but we're not anchoring into it properly. And what is our data revealing? The data was revealing bias. Mm -hmm. The data was revealing low expectations. The data was revealing the inner disconnect to our students and the low expectations that we had of them. And then I used this. I took to scale the things that I did at my private school that I knew could work on reacculturation because see culture is learned. Culture is passed down in the language, the behaviors and the operations. And so to change the outcomes that result from school culture, you have to change those things. And that calls for new behaviors and new ways of being and doing. You know, one one of the first things you said was the cultural disconnect. And, and I just want to reinforce for the audience, um, when that cultural disconnect exists, you can't take that school to that level that you conceptualized that you want that school to be. Because in terms of the culture, which I loosely call the way of life of the school, it is disconnected. It is this it could be dysfunctional. So now you're, you're, you're focused on this academic growth and development of young people, but the space that they walk into, the environment that they walk into has such a disconnect. So that's gotta be a priority. You know, in, 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 in having, having been a former teacher there, were there resistors on your staff that, that ne didn't necessarily buy in initially? I understand what you said in the previous, but but, just in terms of you arriving, did you sense that at all? It was mostly a warm welcome. Okay. And there were there were resistors. Like once I really got into the meat of it, there, there were resistors. And I had to blatantly just say a name. It felt good to be able to say, I know you all. I know you're not racist. And because you're not racist, I just had to bring the real word. Yeah. I know we can fix this. I know we can fix this. And I said, it must be so painful to come to work every day and be ineffective. Like, ah, oh, to yeah. be called to do something and to not be good at it, but know that you've been called to do it and that you have the technical acumen, but you don't have the being acumen. Mm. I said, just, I said, just trust me. Trust me, y'all, because it's not going to get any worse. You've been doing the same thing for 20 years. Let's just try something different. Roll with me on this. Yes. Just roll yes. with me on this. And it, it makes it so much easier when they trust you yeah. and feel at ease about rolling with you on it. Mm -hmm. so, so, so with that, then I'll, I'll raise this because you gave the demographic of staff. So what are the challenges and, and black women out here? that are on the call, you hear me particularly, but everybody hear me in general. What are the challenges in being a black woman leader in a school where the predominant number of staff don't necessarily reflect who you are as a black woman? Um, definitely the stereotype of being called the angry black woman mm -hmm. that, that definitely came up and it didn't come up initially. It came up more about year two when I had to get extra firm about maintaining the shifts that we had done. And it was really interesting because when I was accused of being an angry black woman, I said, shouldn't we all be angry about this data? I said, I'm not necessarily, you know, taking my anger out on anybody. I said, but this this data is um, creating anger and it should create some anger. Th this data shows that we are literally not preparing children for college. We're not doing what we said we would do. This data says that we are not making it so kids can do algebra by the time they graduate from our school. I said, we should be upset about that. 
And the other is that we also have um, what I call the, the euphemistics language style versus the empowerment language style. So oftentimes, and there's nothing right or wrong about either one. Again, it's the cultural disconnect at play. White people generally speak euphemistically. It's a passive type of language that has innuendo in it where you need to kind of, you know, it would be so nice if you could turn the volume up versus when we're an empowerment language, more the way we're raised as people of color. Can you turn the sound up on that? <laughs> it's just two very different ways of, of getting, yeah. you know, the response that you want versus having the person kind of guess. It would be nice if, well, that sounds like a choice versus a direct, please turn the volume up on that. And it doesn't have to be said in an angry way, a cruel way, or a bossy kind of way. It's simply a, just a very clear directive. And so even again, the style of with which we communicate calls for code switching. And I would tell our teachers, just like we ask our kids to code switch into academic language, I need you all to code switch into empowerment language because that's the language that our children are raised with. So let's let's stay here. Um, I get a lot of in inboxes, um, messages on Facebook from black women principals who say to me, I'm struggling because I'm a black woman. Right. And, 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 and that's that's essentially all they're really saying to me. They, you know, they may, they may give me some detail, but I'm struggling because I'm a black woman and I, and I give them feedback, but I'm giving it through my black male lens. Right. So perhaps there's somebody on the call right now that needs to hear <laughs> that they're not in this thing by themselves in terms of I'm struggling as a black woman. I'm struggling because I'm a black woman. I don't know how to overcome that and, and still be effective in my leadership in bringing myself and my staff full, full force toward ultimate achievement for our young people. What could you say to that, that, that leader, that AP or that principal that may be on the call right now in terms of what I, what I need to do? Yeah. Being a black woman in leadership in, in this way is deeply challenging and it's painful. And it's literally like opening ourselves up to re-traumatization every day. That I have to name is true. Stay true to yourself. Stay true to your purpose and to your calling. We stand on the shoulders of black women, educational leaders and black women leaders we stand on the shoulders of greatness and we know that what we're doing is right. And so again, I take it back to one, setting some of those boundaries, practicing that inner calm, and then also finding a network, setting up or reaching out to even if it's one sister friend, sister colleague in the work that that can be that rock for you. Because again, it's re-traumatizing every day. Because not only is being an AP and a principal already lonely, it's already lonely. It's even lonelier for us as women of color. It's even lonelier. And I know that there are um, different organizations and groups that are starting to, to do support for leaders of color, which is a good thing. And I want to name, and this is important, we are paving the way. See, this is the thing. We've been at eradicating racism in our country for a few hundred years, but not really, not really, not really. It's really only been a few decades. It's really only been a few decades. And so we are trailblazing. We are going first, if you will. I really hate to say that we are going first and it's harder when you go first. And we are literally part of a system that has not yet wanted to face the systemic challenges that it's rooted in. So we're literally trying to dismantle a system that is still 
engaged in its status quo and not and, and, and in, a, in a place of refusal to dismantle itself. It's a really sick place to be in. I hate to say it like that. It's a better word than sick, toxic. It's toxic. And we put ourselves, that's why I say we're on the front lines. We put ourselves as black leaders in this system in toxic situations. And we're doing it for the future of humanity. We're not doing it for this group of kids. We're really doing it for their grandkids. Because that's when we're really going to get to really see systemically the shift. It's happening. It's happening. Oh, it's happening. We're stabbing. So it's not for not, but it's painful. It's painful. It's painful. You know, I I, I intentionally kept this comment on the screen, and I, I don't typically read. Well, some every now and then I read them out loud, but I want to I want to read this one. Um, yes, absolutely. Had to change jobs yesterday because my leadership was not accepted, and I couldn't make moves for kids because teachers refused to be open to equity conversations that would have impacted kids in a positive way. I hope my next seat will be better. Now, I, I left this here because I'm finding that, and you may be finding the same thing, Toby. I want you guys to hear this. A lot of times when a client calls me, they want equity, but they don't, and, and it's a funny thing, they want equity, but they don't necessarily want the word equity to be used. And this is becoming more and more common. Like, like so in other words, equity has been folded into the critical race theory conversation. Mm -hmm. And and for me, I've, I've simplified this definition of equity and I've said it on this broadcast many times, meeting young people where they are, as they are. Yes. And it, it has no political connotation, no racial connotation. It's not the boogeyman, right? It's, it's, it's just meeting. It's just great teaching, wrote a blog about it, meeting young people where they are, as they are. So it is sick that we're in a day and age now where, like as, as, as uh, Jelani said, I can't have the equity conversation with staff. That that's it, and, and I understand that um, and from your vantage point. But that's the that's that's equivalent to the staff saying we don't want to engage in great teaching. We would rather just teach you all the same thing and then you figure it out. We don't want to individualize. We don't want to personalize. We're just going to throw it at you, and now it's up to you as to whether or not you're going to embrace it. That 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 is that is sick. That is wicked. Mm -hmm. Right. What, what are your thoughts on that, Toby? <sighs> That's been the battle. That has been the battle. And that teachers somehow have felt empowered to gatekeep in that way. And 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 really, they don't to me, when a teacher says that they don't see the purpose uh, of what they've been called to do or what they've agreed to do. I was thankful that the group of teachers I was leading was willing to look at it. Again, I went back into what are the strengths that we're bringing, but what is our data not revealing about these strengths? Where's, where's the gap? And I made the gap so obvious to them, pictures, graphs, all of that, so obvious that they had to, they could only hold up the mirror, Principal Caffelli, they could only hold up the mirror because these are children. And so how can you say that you you, you got kids in, in one department for four years that can't do the task at hand from ninth grade? Yeah. And you've had them for four years. That's a failure of adults. That is a failure of adults. And so we have to really start being that explicit about it and and name that challenge. One thing that I wanted to add when you asked me some of the things that I did, <clears throat> some teachers did some shadowing of each other. So I had teachers follow a student schedule for the day. There were four teachers. They followed a special ed student. They followed um an honor student, an AP student, and an EL student, excuse me, it was five, and a, and a black boy student schedule, like just a, a fairly non-challenging. They picked those schedules, five teachers, 
because I wanted them to see how there was no school culture, that everybody was so doing their own thing that the students were challenged in going through these what I called micro environments from period to period instead of having this larger cohesive experience, mm. which is and when you have a larger cohesive experience, that's culture. <laughs> culture is the larger cohesive experience that mm. generates the outcome. And so after they did that, that's really when they said, OK, Things are looking a bit like a mess. We're going to do some of these things she's asking us to do. And then I brought the teachers on board to start massaging. It took us six months. We worked with a list of 30 things I wanted people to do. We worked on it for six months where we could reach agreement. And it became called the rebel way. And it was a set of expectations. And catch this. It was a set of expectations for adult behaviors not for student behaviors. Yeah. The student behaviors would fall into place from the shift in adult behaviors. So we didn't even have to really teach kids specific behaviors. We taught them routines from the adult behaviors. Mm. And that's how the shift happened. And when one teacher who was an outstanding veteran teacher said to me, Tovi, this school is finally a school where I would set my own child. That was in year two. I knew that we had crossed over. There you go. Yeah. And that's, and that's really where you want the teachers to be. Yes. That I, I'm comfortable with my child being a student in this school. You know, on, on your website homepage, there's a profound statement, which, a statement which reads the following. Our work is sacred. And so are we. We cannot teach what we do not embody. We lead from who we be in capital letters, not just what we do in capital letters. In order to transform our schools, organizations, and systems, we must first transform ourselves. Now, when I read that, I said to myself, my proverbial bam, right? Because when I wrote this, the equity and social justice education, mm -hmm. fiction, the foundation of that book is the following statement. It's not enough to do equity with capital letters do. You must be equity. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember when I started using that as a workshop topic before I um, wrote the book, some would question that or challenge it to say, yeah, but we have to do this work and I don't have time to get them to be equity. They got to do equity. I said, yeah, I, I hear you. I hear the urgency, but you can't do equity effectively if you don't embody equity okay. because because then it's just a, a, a practice, but there's no emotion. There's no essence that accompanies it. So then I went on and I said, I, I, I built on that and I said, equity can't solely be something that you do. Equity must be who you are. And then I went further. I said, equity is a reflection of the educator's humanity yes. for the students that he or she services. And then I went just one tab further and I said, equity is a window to the educator's soul. Now that's that's kind of heavy, but 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 I felt like I had to take it there, right? So so with that said, I want to hey y'all, wait, it's 11:58 Eastern. I'm still in the beginning of this conversation. Look, y'all, hang with us live. Don't don't wait for the video later. Hang with us live because I, I I got a lot on here, man. I, I mean, come on, y'all. So here we go. I want to go line by line on on those four bullet points from your website. So the first, our work is sacred, and so are we. I know you said that in the intro, but now I want you to elaborate. What are you saying when you're saying it's sacred, and so are we? I'm saying that our work is sacred. Because people turn over their most precious resource to us, their children. 
their children. They literally turn them over to us. And there's a sacredness with working with children, with working with the pure heart. There's a sacred, <laughs> there's a sacredness to, to how we show up to grow a future full fledged adult person, young adult person, to be a thinker, to be a lover, to be a carer, to be empowered. And when we first acknowledge our work as being very sacred and being a calling, I feel like we are called into education because it is so trying and so difficult as a profession. It has to be something that that pulls on us to serve in this way of being, you know, servant leadership that we then have to view that work as, oh, then we do have to look at our own spirit. We do have to look at our soul. We have to look at ourselves as sacred. So when we treat our profession as sacred, the way we carry it out is sacred. That's where the beingness comes in because the lens of the being impacts your doing. To get these teachers to shift, we didn't focus on standards. We didn't focus on curriculum. We focused on how are you delivering what you do? How are you being equity? And then it shifted. That's when it shifted. We didn't even focus on curriculum, Principal Caffelli. That's what was so crazy. My secondary director couldn't believe it. She was like, Toby, just don't mess this up. I'm giving you six months <laughs> because I told her, I said, I need to hijack all the staff meetings. I need to hijack all my time to re-acculturate and build in these norms. I said, that's what I need. I need six months. She wow. says, you got six months. I hope this works for both of us. So you essentially, you told her, I, I just lock in my one one of my one of our colleagues just told me show the lock and 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 remind everybody let's lock in and you're saying the same thing to look i need the six months so let this let's lock in on those six months your second one was we cannot teach what we do not embody elaborate on that we can't teach what we don't truly know what we don't truly know and we're saying that we want to, to teach inclusion. We want to be able to have these difficult conversations. But the embodiment isn't there within the leader, within the adult in the room, then you can't teach it. You think you're teaching it, but that's that doing piece and not the being. That's when you're really going through the motions. That's when that's when you know you've literally opened up your lesson plan book and you're following it like step by step without yeah. thinking about the kids and maybe making the tweaks that you needed to make. Or better yet, when you opened up that lesson plan the night before or even the morning of, you cannot teach who you are not. And so we have to dive into that, that inner work to work on embodying that, that healing, to work on embodying that inclusion because it's a feeling tone. When kids have been saying, you know, I ain't feeling this, they're not feeling you. Right. They're not feeling this. They're feeling your bias. They're feeling your dislike. They're feeling your discomfort. They're feeling your white fragility. All of our cultures of people of color, we have to navigate systemic whiteness. Our schools are designed in systemic whiteness. So our kids already know the survival signs that we have to have. And they know when our white teachers are uncomfortable or going through the motions or they ain't got this. And they're going to be kids. They're going to play off of it. They're going to leverage it. It's like, do your work, do your work to serve who you're supposed to serve. And if you can't teach kids of color, you may need to relocate or do your work. I always say, do you teach children or do you teach content? Right. You'll, you'll, you'll never be effective in teaching content if you don't know the children that That's you right. teach and, 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 and all the cultural dynamics that accompany who those young people are. Your, your third bullet point, it said, we, we lead from who we be, not just 
what we do. And I know you've touched on that, but I'm giving you an isolation here. That beingness has a lot to do too with the SEL wheel, the social emotional learning competencies. That wheel is like also adult SEL. If we want to teach students self-regulation and self-management, then we have to be able to do that for ourselves. When we have to embody self-awareness, then we or to teach self-awareness, then we have to embody that. We can't go around. It's like people who teach kids how to meditate. They like put on the video, then go take attendance or something. Yeah. When you don't have your own meditation practice, how are you teaching kids how to meditate? How are you teaching them that self-awareness? How are you working on your own self-mastery? And we have unhealed hearts going into classrooms, creating damage. And so we have our leadership schema. Again, are we heal? Are we leading from a place of an unhealed way of being? Are, are we going to take everything personally? Or are we going to let it just land and let it be where it is because you, you have healed. And a lot of times the schema that we bring in to work with us stems from our own hurts around school, our own educational trauma. So we have to heal our educational trauma so we don't recreate it on others. You, you, you know, you, I was getting ready to write. I got all these notes from you should see my paper. I was getting ready to write it, but you you gave me you, you pause educational trauma. Let me tell you all something and, and, and you guys reflect back on your own reality. Education messed me up. And, and, and I have no problem saying that. I say it all the time. Education messed me up and I had to recover. And, and I recovered primarily from the content of the books you can see on the camera this this is all black studies information and that that rebuilt me you know it gave me new life it gave me a rebirth because that which had i, I had i had been exposed to k-12 that that wasn't what i needed i couldn't be the man i am today if if i didn't have this library and then there's another one across the hall there and another one in another room. I, I wouldn't be that guy, right? So, so just think about your own experience, education, trauma. It, it put me in, in a, traumatic, a, tra a traumatic state, educationally speaking. And there was so much more to me that I didn't know I had until I became a reader of history, African-American history in particular. Yeah. And it, it awakened me to who I am and who was locked in waiting to be unleashed to come out. So so, so with that said, you got this, this last one. It says, in order to transform our schools, organizations, and systems, we must first transform ourselves. And that goes back to anchoring into that beingness and that embodiment. How have you transformed yourself? How have you done your inner work to be more healthy and well, so that when you are working with kids, you're not passing on unhealed tendencies. And again, creating that educational trauma. What you named around the black studies is so critical. When I started my school, we had a history class that was just on our own black history. And that's what re-anchored the kids into their greatness. They wanted to perform to us. They wanted to be great. And they started believing it because they saw that they came from a history of greatness. And yet I was in a public system that I couldn't even get the teachers to acknowledge that Egypt is Kemet. Mm. And to take a five minute lesson before the math lesson to anchor to how this is in the DNA of the Aztecs and the Native Americans and the Comitians so that we can see for the kids that we're teaching, this is in you. This is in you. And they literally say, we don't have time for it. That's the doing, not the being. So if you don't have time to connect what you're teaching to the kids you're teaching it to, you don't have that embodiment of the beingness of the love 
that it takes. This is work of love. Love work. Mm. Education trauma. You know, um, a lot of your work, Toby, um, centers around what you call professional spirituality. Professional spirituality. What is what is professional spirituality and, and how would it benefit our leaders and viewers who are watching this morning um, and aspiring leaders? How, how would that benefit them? Professional spirituality is really the the combination of spiritually conscious principles and research based leadership development coming together. Those things that we know that, again, if our work is sacred, then it requires spiritual practices that keep us going, that keeps us anchored to this calling. And that is equity and inclusion work. That is the work of humanity. It is resilience building. And resilience is cultivated in four distinct areas. That inner cognition, the self-growth, the relational connection we have to people when we can keep our bodies again at at greater equilibrium and being regulated instead of a state of dysregulation our profession often has us in dysregulation hmm. and so our professional spirituality brings in the practices that help keep us regulated are you leading from your vision? Are you anchoring to your purpose every day? Are you meditating? Are you having, I used to create vision boards for my work, vision boards for who I was as a leader. And it would blow my mind that I was like, you know what? These practices work for me personally. I bet you they're going to work professionally. So I had to try all this out for myself to make sure that what I was going to be bringing in was, was possible. And when I created that huge turnaround for the second time, I brought in these practices and it changed the game. And that's when I realized, you know what, this is the calling that it's out to be. And we have got to anchor to this professional spirituality. Wow. Wow. You know, I, I, I got it. I got to say to you, I'm gonna put this back up. <laughs> Edwin Garcia, you may have seen it. I've enjoyed all your speakers, but this conversation is on another level, right? And um, I just wanted you to see that in case you didn't see it, mm. because because it is. It's 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 this is this is some high power stuff here, right? I, I think that everybody on here, and then the folks who don't even know that I have this platform, <laughs> could benefit from um from from all these words of wisdom, and in this case, professional spirituality right you you highlighted two areas where leadership is often problematic um as follows we bring the unhealed elements of ourselves to work daily and we're looking at the wrong data but i want to go back to that first one we bring the unhealed elements of ourselves to work daily and that's why this thing is so critical and, and, and the folks on here that have been regulars, you know, they because they, they, they hear it all the time. I don't have two of these. It's, I mean, I could, I could go on and spend the 50 cents or a dollar, whatever it is, and, and get a second one, a third, fourth, get a few of them. But I only got one because this is my tool. And it comes with me everywhere I go. I'm just make I, I'm just very careful that I don't break it when it's in the bag with all the, you know, I got a camera in there, lights and all that kind of stuff. So... I'm, you know, I'm very careful so I don't break it. But there are those moments in that hotel room where I, I got to go here, right? Because there are those moments when I'm like, I don't want to be here. I want to be home with my wife. I want to, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and then I got to get refocused on the significance of why I'm out in the wilderness somewhere in the first place. And that's what this does. So when I read that again, we bring the unhealed elements of ourselves to work daily. If, if, if I don't stay in here, I may not be able to heal yeah. some of those feelings of, do I really want to do this? Because if I bring that energy to the next presentation or the next consultation, I'm not bringing my best me to that work. So with that said, 
I want you to elaborate on that. We bring the unhealed elements of ourselves to work daily, to work daily in terms of one of those problematic areas of leadership. Yes, absolutely. It's interesting because it looks a little bit different based on the skin that we're in. And when I see unhealed leaders, uh, particularly unhealed, I'll start with, with white leaders, unhealed white leaders, oftentimes there's a piece of what is often referred to by Robin D'Angelo of, of white fragility that exists that, that creates a, a shrinking in that white leader that doesn't allow them to skillfully access their courage. And so white fragility is really an emotional response. It's an emotional response to the discomfort of equity work. And that's why my work focuses on emotionally intelligent equity and inclusion, because before we can really do the equity, we do have to go into the beingness of it by simply healing the emotions around it. What are the discomforts that you're having in discussing race? What is coming up for you around why it's hard to talk about race, why it's hard to talk about homophobia, why it's hard to talk about all these things that support a less inclusive environment. Very, very challenging. And in terms of people of color and what we often need to heal is the lack of trust, the lack of trust in being able to, to, to change a system, of being able to change the hearts and minds of people in the system. And for me also, it was, I did have to heal my own anger mm. because to have emotionally intelligent equity and inclusion, I had to engage in the conversations from a place of not being angry at white people. So one of my sacred agreements when I lead my workshops is we will not vilify white people because we can have this conversation without vilifying anybody. And when people's hearts are in the right place, when that genuine care is there, then we can definitely anchor to the ways of being that are needed. <laughs> Thanks, Vincent. We can anchor to the places that are needed to be accessed to do the work well. We have the proof of it. We have the proof of it. And the thing is, it doesn't take years and years and years. It takes deep work that's targeted and focused and consistent so that you can get back in to the teaching part of it. Go in to go deep and start re-engaging with your curriculum as you go and evolve. The lens is the lens. I know I'm being long-winded. I got to say this one last piece. In one of my workshops, in several, the, this one school for the deaf from the East Coast has been participating. And I never was trained to teach deaf students, but my lens is inclusive. And so because my lens is inclusive, I started asking myself the right questions on what's it going to take for my deaf students to have a quality experience. And I had to be open to the feedback that I was being given about what could also increase the experience. And I didn't go back to, oh, I'm going to need a class on that or, oh, I'm going to need some professional learning. No, I had to be able to change and improve by the next session within a few days. Mm -hmm. So I had to be open to not getting it exactly right immediately and being okay with that. My deaf students had a powerful experience so much so that the organization has, keep, has kept coming back. But that's my inclusive mindset. Not that I've gone to any professional training on how to teach deaf students. Mm. That's the power of the embodiment. That's the power of healing the unhealed elements of ourselves. I love it. That's powerful stuff. And, and you know, you talk about the um, looking at the wrong data. Yes. What, do you, what, what does that mean? Ooh, looking at the wrong data. 
our data is going to show us where the problem really lies in the system itself that we are working in. So in our school, for instance, if our data is showing that the black boys are not reading well, the black boys, and it says that for the last 10 years, that's an issue that we have with black boys. That's not an issue with the reading program. That's an issue that we're not able to reach and teach black boys, which is an issue with the adults, not the black boys. Because guess what? That's a different group of black boys. So are we going to keep blaming black boys, children? We're going to keep blaming children for an adult problem. The data will reveal where the, the biases lie. So if we can predict what our prison system is going to look like by being in our educational system in elementary school, that's a systemic challenge. Yeah. That's an adult issue. Yeah. We're literally, you know, blaming the babies and creating prisons off of someone who was nine years old. That is an issue. I'll never forget when I ran the data at my school because the black boys were getting the most referrals. They were getting called out the most. They were getting in trouble the most. And I said one time, it dawned, I mean, I don't know why it took me into my second year also to have this epiphany. I was like, can you run me a, a roster of how many black boys we have in the school? I couldn't believe it. Out of 1,600 students, Principal Cafele, there were only 120 black boys. We had roughly 30 black boys at every grade level in grade nine through 12. Hmm. And I said, so as a system of 80 adults, we're letting 120 kids run us. I said, is that what we're saying? I, I was like, no, no, this is impossible. We're far better than this. We're not getting something right. And so I charged each of my counselors with running a group, an African male achievement group for each grade level of the black boys that was going to be looped. So they were getting additional support. And of course the data started to shift. They needed some targeted attention and targeted support. And I needed to look at what was missing from my teachers inner work around black boys. What were some of their beliefs around black boys? So we had to go there and open up that conversation. And I started having optional. This was another culture changer. I started having optional one hour talks um, every other week with teachers. We're going to talk about black girls and the book Push Out. We're going to talk about black boys and Principal Cafele's list. We're going to talk about. So I didn't bring it and position myself as the expert. I said, you know, come with your questions, come being open minded to conversation. I'm going to bring the refreshments. So after school from 3.30 to 4.30, any group of teachers that wanted to come, yep, ties and offerings, <laughs> any group of teachers that wanted to come because they wanted to engage, there was just no avenue to how to really do it. And that was started the conversation that started opening up. And then guess what I had them do? I had them write down on poster paper their key learnings from our hour together. Oh, I learned this. Oh, this was great for me. I'm going to try this. Then they heard from colleagues where something was working with one of the students they were having problems with. So now they could try what their colleague was trying, but they would never have had that conversation otherwise. That poster paper went right above the copy machine. Mm. So now while their colleagues are making copies, they're seeing, oh, that's a safe place Toby has created to have this conversation. Oh, my colleagues are having these breakthroughs and the number would just grow for those optional conversations wow. because people were seeing that we're just sitting around talking about these things that are on our heart and challenging us. Space is being made for it to happen. That's what needs to happen. Our teachers want this. We just have to make the space. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about going back to your earlier comments on this question about the data of black boys, but going deeper in terms of understanding why it is and thereby forging those conversations with staff. 
And see, that goes back to the discussion that we were having about equity and and, and being fearful of having the conversation or or being cautious about it because of politics. So if if we don't have that, if, if, if we look at data and data says black boys are not reading at grade level or above, but we don't have the deeper conversation as to what's going on and why that is, then the rhetorical question becomes, then how do we correct it? We're, we're afraid to approach it. So mm -hmm. therefore we're, we're accepting they're not reading at grade level as a natural condition. This is just what it is. They just can't read, right? As opposed to going deeper and understanding. And, 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 and as you've alluded to so many times, the, the, the problem is in the mirror. Yeah. But we have to have, and let me, let me holler at somebody out there. We have to have the audacity. I don't care what the politics of your district. You knew the politics before you entered the district. We have to have the audacity to engage staff in the relevant conversation. If you can't lead with a spine, this is not for you. You, you, right. you have to be willing. I don't care if you're black, white, Latinx, Asian, Native American. It doesn't matter. This is what you chose. And therefore, you have to have the audacity to lead because that's what it boils down to. Leadership, which which takes me right to the next question. You know, there, there, there's there's a heavy duty push to be anti-racist in schools. Right. There's this there's, there's, there's conversation across the country. There are books written, con uh, blogs, tweet, Twitter chats, you know, all, all sorts of things. I became a teacher in 1988, Toby, and there was no language called anti-racist. I was just that guy, but I didn't have that. I, I called it, you know, in terms of just my self-identification, my students were 100 percent black. The community was 100 percent black, but the teaching force was about 90 percent white, if not higher. I just called it, I'm being African centered, yeah. right? And then somewhere many years later, maybe 20 years later or so, here comes this language of anti-racist. Well, well, in terms of being this anti-racist educator, and you know, anti-racist in terms of practices, in terms of curriculum, et cetera, that's always who I've been. I've been in various degrees of trouble, good trouble as a result, but it's okay, no, nothing regrettable, re regretted there. But Here's my question for you. When we talk about dismantling and disrupting racist practices, racist curriculum, racist whatever within a school district, my question that I ask a lot of people, so as we dismantle, where do we go from there? Like, like so, so what, what is the end game? What do we want in place? And I, and, and I just want to give you my answer in terms of if someone asked me the question. If I'm with black students, and, because black students is really where we are, right, or, or young people of color in this discussion, I want to replace it with curriculum and instruction and practices that speak directly to them so that they see themselves in the learning, that they see themselves on the pages, but that the teacher sees them with unlimited potential to achieve anything they set their sights on achieving while still being very much cognizant that these are children of color specifically these are black children these are latino children these these are Asian, so these are native american children these are children with the reality that they were born into so again i, I threw a lot at you to simplify it to shorten it after dismantling or disrupting mm -hmm. we build what yes beautiful question and that I feel is what we are, um, what I say, living into. We're, we're being in a space that is allowing for that vision to emerge of um, once things are dismantled. <clears throat> and what will that really look like? Excuse me one second. Mm -hmm. And and this dismantling, I've been sitting with the, the idea that it's going to take, not that it that it could happen sooner than, than we are purporting it to be. I feel like it's going to take at least two generations of K through 12 education. So a, a good, um, you know, 25 years, because 
what I think that you and I have been grappling with are people that have not been acculturated and raised in a space where it's normal to have these conversations. And so we're constantly battling the discomfort, constantly battling the challenge of, oh, I can't have these conversations. What's crazy is how is how people are paid to facilitate these spaces as an educational leader, but then can't have the conversation when it comes to the equity and inclusion. So you can talk about everything else but now you can't talk about this and this is so core to the work. So I purport that if we were bold enough and courageous enough, and I say courage is the cure. If we are courageous enough to begin teaching our students as early as, as pre-K and having these inclusive conversations all the way up to grade 12 graduation, then they truly will have the acumen and comfortability because it takes the both the be and the do to have these conversations in college, to know what that looks like in applying inclusion in the workspace because they've already done it as students and they've seen it as students. So now they become part of our workforce and in our industrial sector and in our thought leader sector and our corporate sector, just all of that, the entire workforce of our nation will have been acculturated to normalizing inclusion. That's all it is, it's just normalizing it. Yeah. And so truly within 25 years, we could have a society that has normalized this work. That for me is what the future vision is and systemically how we can get there. It's not really hard, except for the fact that we're still in the dismantling process of getting the adults on board to even start at the pre-K and mm -hmm. do that through the 12. Is that making sense? Make, makes a, a wealth of sense, you okay. know, formalize and see if this, as I show a lot of when I'm doing my virtual presentations here, if this is a photograph, of the audience on the, in the virtual space and I, a, a, a group photo, then here's all of the participants on the screen. So when they get a copy of this photo that I send them, then the first person they look for in the photo is themselves, right? Because, because I am the most relevant person in a photo where I'm included. But so many black and brown children, they receive a photo that looks like this. So this I'm using, this was a real photo, but this I'm using symbolically to say curriculum and instruction. So now youngster is in a classroom saying, wait a minute, teacher, when I was in class yesterday, I was sitting right here. And another one said I was sitting here and another one said I was sitting here and et cetera, it goes on. But the bottom line is teacher said, but I didn't realize. So they're saying, why did you cut me out of the photo? And the teacher's saying, I didn't realize that I did, but apparently I really did cut you out. So why am I going to pay attention to a photo where I've been intentionally removed from it? And that's what so many young people of color are grappling with every day. They're sitting in classrooms and they do not see the relevance of what that eight day, eight day portion of their day is about as it relates to them, right? So, so it's, it's so important that as we think about dismantling and disrupting, simultaneously we're thinking about and how do we ensure that we are inclusive, that black children, Latino children, et cetera, young people of color are in the photo. I love it, I love it. You know, so so there's a video, I want you guys out there in the, the, the stream yard world to check out of Tovey, and um, I, I wish I could recall the title. You may recall the title of that video. Uh, with, with, with embodied the, allyship. Yeah, em, embodied allyship. I want you guys to check that out. And I took a question from it. And and in that in in that video, um, your fo the focus is on dismantling the racist aspects of the school system. Uh, you indicated it is not a white. It's it's, it's not a. Let me get this right. You indicated it is not a white and bipoc black indigenous people of color battle but instead a battle between conscious white a conscious white person 
and an unconscious white person. There's a lot to unpack there, but a whole lot of relevance for a school leader. What, what, what exactly did you mean by that statement? What I meant by that is we have BIPOC want to dismantle the system. We're working diligently every single day to dismantle the system. That has been in our D it's in our DNA. It's been, we've been trying to dismantle the system since we got here. Yeah. So hundreds of years of us trying, we're not like new to this. And it's not, this is not our battle because we didn't create the system. And so the battle is between the unconscious and the conscious within the white community in terms of who was willing to give up power because an empowerment model means that there's shared power mm -hmm. versus the way that the system currently stands where only some people are empowered and others are not in any power. And so what, how can white people be working with other white people to dismantle the system of racism within education is what it's going to take because truly it's those people who are, are governing what the creation is of the system that we have. And if we, if it were going to change fast, that's how it would need to happen because it's the white people who are the gatekeepers, particularly the unconscious white people who are gatekeepers in keeping the system at status quo. And it's always easy to be like, oh, you know, that's a black woman or that's a Latino man. And, and they're trying to do what they're supposed to be doing because it serves their community. But it's different when a conscious white person is constantly battling with the same fervor that we have against an unconscious white person. And that consciousness, when I say unconscious and conscious, that consciousness is one of love and inclusion. Yeah. And see, again, it's not even about racism or being racist. It's a consciousness of inclusion because I feel that all people are called into this profession from a sense of care. Everybody cares. But what does your care look like? How do you walk out that care? Yeah. We got to do more than just care. You got to have what I call skillful caring. And that's and, and you know, when I when I when I watched it, I thought about Malcolm, Malcolm X, because because that's what he said, he, you know, in terms of a white person saying to him, how can we help by going back into your community and organizing, right, to 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 assist the struggle of black people. So here it's the same dynamic in terms of what the, the, the um, what you stated in the video that it's one thing for a, a, a black white battle. But it's another thing when the conscious white person goes to the community, look, this is what it is, right? We need to collaborate amongst one us, amongst ourselves in order to resolve some of these issues that 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 black children, black people are grappling with within a school district, right? Good stuff. So you know, in terms of that tough conversation, um, I'm I'm sure I'm I'm willing to bet probably everything I own that there are people on this call right now who are who are sitting there watching saying man I, I hear this i got it but the reality is i got to go back into my school on monday and i i can't have some of this conversation the politics won't allow it i my job security may not be secure right if if i go back and have some of some of the conversation relative to race um with staff so 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 for example i'm thinking about me and you talked about normalizing to have the conversation with my staff around race culture equity diversity etc cultural responsiveness cultural relevance that was just normal they expected that because that's who i was as leader so it became mm -hmm. a part of the culture of a staff meeting but what i want you to do Talk to that leader out there that's either watching us live or who will check the video later that wants to go back into that school, have that staff meeting and have the real conversation. The conversation that probably was the impetus for them being a leader in the first place, but they got in there and then discovered, at least felt that 
I don't know if I can have this conversation and be able to maintain employment in this district. How does that leader have that conversation despite whatever the politics of the district may be? Right. First of all, we acknowledge, absolutely acknowledge the challenges that we are under at this time. And leaders, what we also have to know and acknowledge is naming the depth of compassion that we have to have, because now we can really see the types of pressure that happens when race and inclusion are compounded with other external pressures, meaning the profession has already been hard and challenging, and now there's also COVID. So that's been compounded with, with what we're dealing with. And now we have all this civil and racial unrest that continues to operate in our oppressive systems. That's an additional pressure. And how can we say that we don't have time for this? How that statement in and of itself lacks compassion because now white people are learning firsthand on what it's like to carry racial strife with the regular day to day, with the regular societal pieces. There's a compounded stress that happens for people of color. And now more than ever, we need our white colleagues to anchor to that compassion for us and see the, the difficult challenges that arise, the difficultness. And then the thing is that we have the strength to deal with it. We have the skills to deal with it. We have the space to deal with it. And ask, ask your staff, what do you want to engage in? If our data is showing this about this group, what do you think is a next step for us? What it feels like a next step. Bring in the staff. Sometimes we lead this work thinking it's one thing and we don't bring in who we're serving. And so we have to bring in that piece and take that into consideration when we're shaping what our professional learning looks like so that we can offer it from a place that that felt um, fed, if you will, fr from the staff voice in some way. But key is letting them know it's not off the table. Like it's not going off the table, which is what I hear that a lot of staff have been asking for, particularly this year. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said that 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 comment lacks compassion. And again, it lacks your understanding of the depth of people of color in this country. Because we have no choice but to carry both. And so if you are really down for dismantling, if you're really down for being down for us, then you're down for carrying this with us. Yeah. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I came right to the end and um, we're at the point now where we go to that rapid fire questions. I call them my BAM impact questions. Last week I, I went solo. So I shared the sort of questions were to the audience. And although they're to you um, this afternoon, now I still want the audience to, process the questions for yourself, but they rapid fire, one word answer or one sentence if, if it requires a sentence. Here we go, 21 questions. Is education on the right path for underserved children? Yes. Can true equity occur in America's schools for black, brown and other underserved students? Absolutely. Does your work contribute to the progress we desperately need? More now than ever. If you could do a reset on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? The same. Why do you continue to do this work? I have no other choice. What fires you up within the work that you do? Knowing that change is happening, although sometimes it feels slow, I just stay the course, absolutely stay the course. What do you love about the work you do? The growth that happens, the feedback I get, the way things land, that people respond well. Change what you, happens. What do you dislike about the work you do? 
my biggest dislike is that the people who need my work are the ones who are interviewing me about the work and they get afraid. And yet they don't even know what they fully need. What has been your greatest victory in this work to date? Mm -hmm. That I am still here doing the work. <laughs> what was your greatest mistake? Come back to that one. <laughs> what has been your greatest challenge? Finding the peace to not vilify white people. Are you proud of your first year as an assistant principal? Oh, absolutely. But I cried on my very first day. Mm. Are you proud of your first year as a principal? Yes. Who inspires you in this work? You, Zaretta, Chris Emden, the people that have gone before me, Gloria Latz and Billings, so much. Uh, we come from excellence in education. We come from that. I appreciate you. What are you reading right now? Uh, Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown and also um, some work of Mary Frances Winters, who's a black woman, generally in corporate, and she does work around difficult conversations. Mm. What book would you recommend for our viewers this morning, this afternoon? Hmm. I'm looking up at my list here because there's so many. Um, I'm going to say The Deepest Well by Nadine Burke Harris. Dr. Nadine Burke Harris talks a bit about, uh, not a bit, talks about trauma, healing, and how we can move forward, particularly in supporting kids through the ACEs. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? Whew. There is so, so much. Um, I have yet to publish more. And so I want to publish more books and articles. And I also want to have a complete certification program in my approach. Wow. Are you satisfied with where you are professionally right now? No. And I should be, but no. <laughs> well, my, my, my hashtag is never satisfied. Yeah. What could you say to a viewer out there who continues to face closed doors? Maybe it's the wrong door. And what could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? And closed doors can be blessings also, but could be the wrong door. Ask the other question again, please. Yeah, yeah. What could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? Ah. Uh, pause and go within the the fire may not be there but the flame still is and lastly if toby if if toby scruggs hussein was a word in a dictionary mm. what would be your definition the goddess at work bringing great intentionality moving from leadership doing to leadership being Oh. Hey, folks out there, before we close out, I want you to know how you can get in touch with Toby. I want you to know how you can book her. I want you to know how you can get her book, right? And, and or contact her or follow her on social media. Give it all to him. There's a lot happening this month. So my website is uh, TCS and it's there on the screen for you. So you can find some things there. There are great freebies, downloads and eBooks. There's even a curriculum that you can take through with your staff on the stories of racial healing and start having your staff connect and be empathetic to each other through those stories. So check out that curriculum. Um, of course, follow my IG and Facebook, my Instagram is Goddess at Work, and my Facebook is Toby Scruggs Hussein. Um, January is loaded. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. PST, I'm doing a professional spirituality vision work workshop for 90 minutes. You can still register for that on the events page of my website, and we'll get you in there for tomorrow morning. Embodied allyship is intentionally starting on one of the greatest racial healing allies of our times, birthdays, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
on his birthday, we'll be launching our series of embodied allyship to do that deep inner work of racial healing that will literally shift your professional work. It will shift your experience. And then finally, to support courageous leadership, an intensive training with um, Brene Brown's work on Dare to Lead is happening January 27th through 29th with me and my co-facilitator. And so we're happy to have you in that. And you can also find that registration information on the events page as well. So thank you so much again for having me. This was so powerful. I appreciate you. And you got a you got a lot going on. And uh, hey, folks, reach out, you know, um, tell your superintendent or those of you with the authority to bring in consultants and speakers. Um, there's the website there tcs.com right there on the on the screen reach out and i'm sure you'd love to have a full day half day keynote uh consulting whatever it is there it is and then um the book which i was supposed to have here in front of me but it's it's all right on a different shelf oh my god i'm just honored it's in your library don't worry about it that book is uh called be a parent champion on family <laughs> engagement it's and Name on me. It's all good. It is all good. <laughs> the fact that it's even in your shelf with all those greats is is fabulous I'll, and confirmed. I'll have it on the screen next week, folks. I, I swear I think I brought this book out, man. I swear. I didn't. It's on the it's on the other shelf. Anyway, okay. folks. Um appreciate you all being here. And Toby, I appreciate you being here with us this morning and afternoon for almost two hours of a dynamic conversation and i'm sure that um once again the, i'm looking at the comments and i mean the, the folks were the folks were loving it so i i appreciate that when you said um you had mentioned something when with with a guy vincent stallings that's my guy we go back to teenage years he we we taught together he was my assistant principal and that's my dude you know so uh good to see you dr stallings always let me close out stay right there toby uh next week I got on a local principal right here in Jersey City. His name is Principal Chris Gadston. So he'll be with us next week. So tune in, folks. It's going to be another great one, as they say, another banger. Don't forget School Talk, my new platform. Um, subscribe to my principal, uh, Cafe Lay Speaks to Educators channel. I got Dr. Donna Ford, the gifted education guru. Um, we'll be talking cultural competence, gifted education, and so much more. That'll be on that channel. You can't watch this on my virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page or um, YouTube channel. You got to subscribe to that channel. You can watch us on Twitter on my regular page or you can watch us on my Principal Cafe Lay page. Right. But not on the virtual AP stuff because I'm keeping those as two separate entities. Um, make sure you uh, register for the conference ASCD Virtual Leadership Summit January the 18th. Uh, through 20th. I'm going to be the opening keynoter on the 18th. Watch my man, Sean Hurt. It's, it's his birthday today. Every Saturday is at 10 o'clock, Facebook Live, followed by Dr. Sheikha Houston and Tammy Taylor at 1030 at the Create and Educate uh, page. And then my man, Josh Tovar and the crew uh, um, unlock the middle on Sunday nights at seven on Facebook Live. And then Village, the Village Leadership Group with Dr. Roz Gaskins and Coach Williams on Tuesdays and Thursdays at six. Don't forget the assistant principal 50, <clears throat> equity and social justice education 50. You can get them anywhere education books are sold. Go to Amazon, get yourself a copy now. That edu that equity book, well, they're, both of them, they're really selling like, uh, like none other that, of any books that I've written over the years. Visit principalcafele.com for all your resources. And lastly, I'll have the commentary up tomorrow morning that will be built upon our conversation today on the Virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page. Lastly, your diet. Eat right, y'all. Eat right. I know every now and then you got to sneak in that snack. You know, I do it. You know, I do. I'm going to be watching football all day, man. You know, so all day today, all day tomorrow. So, you know, I got to slip in my snack. It's popcorn. You know, that's that's my thing. Ever since I came out the womb, I came out the womb eating popcorn, man. That's that's just my thing. You know, but skinny pop, right? It ain't like it's not a lot in there. And then, you know, I'm not going, I, you know, I don't advocate for, 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 for you getting vaccinated and all that. I will let other people do that. I don't do it. I'm just, I just tell you all the time, I'm vaccinated, right? I'm vaccinated. I'm, I'm boosted. And I took a test two days ago. 
right? So I mean, I'm you know, I'm I'm just doing what what I got to do for me, right? You do what you got to do, but just put this on, y'all. Look. Do I look ridiculous? Yeah, pretty much, you know. I mean, you know, this ain't how I want to be walking around places but, and, and flying in the plane, but you know, this is what I do. So just keep the mask on. This thing is getting like old, man. It's getting stale. It's still talk. It's 2022, and we still talking, having the same conversation about a virus. Come on, man. Just put the mask on. For, you know, your your politics could be your politics. I don't care. Just put the mask on. That's that's all I'm asking you, right? But 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 without, I think that's it. So so here we go. I see you next week. Right. 1055. So with that being said, have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace and blessings. Peace. That's right. Thumbs up. Cock that fist back. Count the three. One, two, three. Bam! <laughs> I'll see y'all next week, man. 1055. Glad you're here. Stay safe out here.